Have you ever wondered how digital slot card tracks work? Maybe? Well, the answer depends on how you ask the question. If you ask it like this, digital slot card tracks, how does that work? Then you just found out that it's a thing and all you want to know is what it is and what does it do. But if you ask like this, digital slot card tracks, how does that work? Well, then you're familiar with it, but now you want to know how does it do what it does? Behind the scenes, you know, the science. And that's the question that I'm here to answer. To a certain degree. Hello again, race fans, and welcome back to the channel. Now, before I get into the information, I just want to acknowledge that I know that, uh, you know, depending on the viewer, we're going to have uh, different you know, levels of understanding or uh, familiarity uh, with digital slot car tracks. And so, as I'm going through this information, uh, especially in the beginning, uh, there may be some of you that are going, uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, you know, tell me something I don't know. And, and I promise I will tell you something that you don't know, but uh, just for the benefit of some of those who uh, might not be too familiar with you know, digital, uh, just bear with me and we'll get to the information that you came for very soon. And some of the info I'm going to come at from the perspective of analog slot cars just kind of establish like a, a basis of, of understanding. So uh, with that being said, let's get into it. Uh, one of the first things uh, a lot of people probably notice about uh, digital slot cars is the ability to run uh, multiple cars on the same lane, you know, independently uh, of each other. And uh, you know, your level of intrigue might depend on your, your generation. Um, <laughs> what I mean by that maybe is uh, like the younger generation that grew up with you know, uh, more advanced technology uh, might not even think anything of it. Um, you know, they don't know how it works and, and they don't care, you know, so <laughs> that's just me showing my age, you know, now I sound like my parents, you know, kids these days are whatever. Anyway, uh, but yeah, for, for many of us that kind of grew up uh, with analog, uh, you know, and we've had those times on our slot car track where we're racing and then the car, uh, you know, inadvertently just skips lanes and, you know, now the other guy's, you know, controlling my car, right? Um, and so you know, we see a digital slot car set able to, uh, you know, use the same lane um, with different controllers. And we say, that's impossible, right? <laughs> how, does, how does it do that, right? Um, well, it all starts with the controller. Now, unlike an analog uh, slot car set where the controller is essentially wired directly to one lane, uh, where the position of the throttle changes the voltage in that lane and then of course that voltage determines how fast the car goes uh, with uh, with the digital though the uh, inputs from the controller are all rooted through uh, a processor so that's all the controllers that are hooked up to the track uh, we'll go through this processor now this one uh, is an older career unit it was called the black box uh, the newer one's called the control unit scale electrics is uh, arc pro plus or arc pro uh, power base so all these signals, though, that are coming in from the, from the controllers, um, the processor is essentially just assembling this into a binary code. Uh, binary meaning just, you know, ones and zeros, uh, right, digital. And it takes this binary code then and embeds it into the power in the track. Uh, and then, of course, those are received by the cars. Now, in order to be able to uh, you know, send this, uh, you know, this code out, the power in the track, uh, is on all the time, um, as evidenced by the fact that uh, both of these uh, cars have their lights on. So there's obviously power in the track. And so, again, if you go back to, you know, if you have a, an analog background, you go, okay, if there's, <laughs> if there's power in the track, how come the cars aren't going, right? Well, that's because uh, the decoder in the car hasn't sent power to the motor yet. A decoder. And that would be, okay, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, every digital car has a, a decoder. And most times you'll just hear it referred to as a chip. But if I wanted to get anal about it, uh, and I do actually, a uh, chip is just a component. Uh, this entire assembly or circuit board uh, with all of its component is the decoder. And now the decoder uh, is powered or is wired to 
uh, the brushes or the pickups uh, up front, just like uh, an analog car would get power. However, unlike an analog car, uh, there is no direct connection uh, to the, the motor to the, the pickups in the front. Instead, the motor is uh, connected to the decoder, and that only gets power when the decoder sends power, uh, and it only does that when it gets instruction to do so, and of course, uh, that instruction is in the form of that uh, embedded code in the power of the track. Uh, now also, uh, each of these decoders uh, can be assigned a an ID, uh, one through six. Uh, for Carrera, I believe Scale Electric also has six assignable IDs. And so, important to remember when we come back to the track here. So back to the track and we've got uh, our controller. Now if we plug this controller into port number three on the processor. Now I'm not going to plug this in because I, if I do I know at some point in this video I'm going to hit the throttle on this controller and I'm going to drive my car off the end of the track. So we're just going to pretend that it's in three. Um, now any you know, inputs though that are you know, coming through uh, port number three now are essentially uh, ID specific. Okay, so when the uh, when the processor uh, puts together this binary code, uh, let's see, we got half throttle here on this controller. Now uh, uh, that half throttle is uh, specific to ID or car number three. So um, now, and the way that it, it encodes this on a real general level is that it sends uh, the info in packets. Okay, so uh, you know what's a packet? You know, it's just a, a bundle or a group. You know of data or, or information and your your you know internet router at home works this way. actually the entire internet works this way um, where it's not just this endless stream of you know bits and bytes uh, flowing back and forth but everything's sent in uh, little you know groups or packets of information um, and so this processor here uh, will send out 10 packets uh, every cycle um, and uh, that's every 73 milliseconds. And so uh, that sounds like a, a short period of time, and, and it is. Um, however, if you do the math, uh, that comes out to uh, just under 14 uh, cycles per second. So you know, the entire track and each car on the track that's uh, getting these packets uh, are being updated uh, about 14 times per second. So um, now, to me, that doesn't sound like enough, like frequently enough, um, but it works. So, hey, what do I know? Uh, anyway, of these 10 packets uh, that are you know, being sent out or encoded in the power, six of those, six, <laughs> six of those are car packets. So there's a packet per car. So uh, when uh, car number you know, one here, for example, that's coded to, to ID number one, um, that sees packet number one uh, and it ignores the rest. And then car number three here, uh, for example, that's on ID three. And again, we have half throttle here. Um, so that package comes in or the packet comes in and the car number three goes, hey, that's for me, you know, you got a delivery, right? And then it then uh, will, will follow the instructions uh, contained therein. Uh, and in this case, uh, it would be send 50% power to the motor. Uh, so uh, this, uh, I guess demonstrates you know how we're able to run uh, cars you know, on the same lane independently of each other or even you know more cars than we have lanes you know again the the controller you know it's not wired or assigned to a lane but rather a car is assigned to a controller yes science so pretty straightforward so far right okay let's move on Another feature that stands out with digital over analog is the uh, ability to switch lanes at these, at these lane change sections of track and also the uh, integrated uh, lap counting and they use an additional technology to make that work. Um, now an integrated lap counter in a, in a slot car track, really nothing new, just that with analog, um, it essentially just uh, didn't know what car was going by, right? It just knew something in that lane went by, right? Just assuming it's the correct car. Uh, now with, with digital though, uh, the car going say across the start finish line, doesn't matter what lane the car is, doesn't matter if there's multiple cars in a lane, uh, the system always knows which car that was. And in order to do that, it uses infrared. Uh, now if you've got uh, Carrera or, or uh, 
uh, scale electric, then you know you recognize this, which is a uh, infrared emitter on the bottom of each car, and actually it's part of the uh, decoder. Uh, now you might say, hey, that that's an LED, and well, yes, you'd be correct. It is a light emitting diode. Uh, however, the light that it emits is infrared light, um, and so it's actually more accurately called an IR LED. Uh, now it's the same uh, same infrared that a lot of say remote controls use, like for your television. Uh, you got that uh, the IR LED there at the end. Uh, now, if you were to look at that LED there and push buttons on the remote, you really can't tell anything that's going on or happening there. Uh, and that, of course, is because you know we can't detect. Uh, light in the infrared spectrum, uh, but electronics can, uh, including uh, this camera. So if I were to uh, point this remote at the camera here and press some buttons, uh, you can see that the camera detects that that flashing. Now, of course, the the TV has an infrared uh, receiver or, or infrared sensor, you know, that's reading those those codes, uh, and then knows you know whether to you know channel up, down, volume, you know, on, off. Uh, and so forth. Um, and so then the cars, you know, working the same way, you just got to think of you know, the car as uh, the remote uh, and the track uh, as the TV. And if I take this car, uh, turn it upside down, wire it up, and turn the power on, you can see that the camera and it's detecting that that IR LED is on. Now it looks like it's on solid, but it's actually turning on and off several thousand times a second. Uh, you know, with Carrera, uh, that rate, uh, it's flashing essentially, uh, ranges anywhere between uh, 3,000 hertz or 3 kilohertz up to, it's either 14 or 15,000 uh, hertz or 15 kilohertz. And that depends, or that rate depends on what ID that decoder is set to. So uh, an ID number one will flash at a set certain frequency, ID number two will flash at another or a different frequency, uh, three, four, you know, and so on. Um, now when we put this car on the track, when this car is powered, that uh, LED is flashing all the time. So whether it's sitting still uh, or it's racing on track or it's sitting in pit lane, uh, it's constantly emitting its, its ID. So when a car crosses over the start finish line, you know, regardless of what lane it's in, uh, the sensor in the track picks that up and it can determine uh, which car it was based on the frequency that that LED is flashing. So pretty neat, right? Uh, now, uh, I mentioned before that we've got six IDs for the cars. There's actually eight. Uh, now there's six of them that are assignable for uh, live drivers, uh, but now with uh, Carrera you have the ability to set up uh, the autonomous cars, um, uh, ghost car, uh, they might call it. Um, now when you set up a ghost car, right, it just runs around the track kind of by itself. Now anytime that you set a car to a ghost car mode, it will take on the ID of seven. And then ID number eight is reserved for uh, the safety car, pace car for Carrera. The lane change functionality uses uh, infrared also. Uh, now when I was saying before about uh, these packets uh, of information, um, there's 10 packets that go on the cycle and then um, six of those are for cars. Now there's also two packets that is just lane change information, you know, which cars want to change lanes. And so you might ask, um, you know, well, why isn't that lane change information included with the car packet, right? It's the car that wants to change lanes. Uh, well, uh, with Scale Electric and Carrera, at least anyway, the lane changes aren't initiated by the car, uh, but rather by the track. Okay, so when we have our, again, controller number three, let's say, uh, we've got the lane change button down. So now uh, this packet, um, this lane change packet now includes a lane change uh, for car number three. So every lane changer on the track now is receiving this, this packet or this instruction now that says, hey, when you see car number three, right, so how does the lane changer do that? Now, now this is a, a pit entry piece, but it's essentially a lane changer. Uh, and of course they have sensors on those, so the lane changer itself knows what car is uh, you know, crossing over. 
uh, but just like each car, uh, each lane changer has a decoder also. And so that's what's receiving those, those packets and decoding uh, the lane change information. Uh, now this is for the pit entry, so the decoder in here is slightly different than the ones for a standard lane change. I'll get into that later. Um, but yeah, when the car comes over now, car number one comes over, and if there's no lane change bit you know, in that packet for car one, it ignores it. You know, it's car number two or five, same thing. But then when it sees car number three, it goes, hey, there's car number three. Uh, and then what it'll do then is energize this solenoid here and then when that's energized that will then pull this lever over and then that opens the gate for the lane change okay now uh, for Carrera uh, the lane change the opening that gate is electronical and the uh, uh, electronical is that a word okay anyway um, but the the closing of the gate uh, is mechanical so when that that gate uh, opens you can see that there's like this little tab right here that moves into the slot here yeah, well, I can see it from the other side maybe um, but yeah that moves into the slot and then so when the car runs over and the uh, changes lanes the guide keel sometimes people call it a guide flag or a, a blade um, when that guide keel though then comes through and makes contact with that tab it just pushes it back where it was you know and then closes the gate so essentially just like you know closing the door behind it uh, scale electric though uh, does not use that mechanical means to close it they actually have two solenoids in their lane change track so one of them to open the gate and one to close it um, now there is a third manufacturer of digital slot cars called scx um, kind of a weird story about scx like Scale Electric bought them out except for like one subsidiary in Spain, kind of weird. Um, anyway, uh, the SCX lane change tracks do not have the electronics in it because uh, for those, the lane change is initiated by uh, the car. So, you know, when we had that lane change packet for Carrera Scale Electric, yes, SCX doesn't have that. Um, but there, then yes, uh, the lane change bit or info is on the car packet um, and then that way those work is they've got a uh, a pin or a piston that uh, when the when the car gets the instruction to to change lanes um, that will then uh, extend out uh, below or through the guide keel about three millimeters uh, you know further out than the guide keel so it's extending further down into the slot of the track and the gate on that lane change piece has a, an extension on it or like a tongue uh, that extends in front of the gate only at that depth where that that pin or that plunger is and so when that pin hits that extension it then moves the gate to the other direction and then after the car passes by it closes with spring pressure essentially it's spring loaded so yeah the cars uh, for SCX a uh, little bit more complex because they have that mechanism in there uh, with that with the lane changer um, but then again uh, their lane change track pieces are a lot less complex, uh, no electronics, uh, and also uh, a lot less expensive at the same time. Now we arrive at the pit stop. Uh, now if you have a Carrera digital track and a pit lane, then uh, it probably looks like this. And if you have an older pit lane, then maybe uh, like this, where you don't have that uh, advanced pit lane adapter, um, or maybe uh, you got a dedicated pit for, say, the, the pace car, in which case you probably don't have that in there either. Uh, regardless, um, depending on the configuration, the fueling uh, functionality works quite differently. Um, this is probably the more common configuration right now, so I'll go over that first. Yeah, so for the operation of the fueling then, of course, we, uh, we switch lanes here at the pit entry uh, and run over this uh, sensor, and so and now the system here knows that this car is in pit lane or at the, at the least very least it knows that it ran over that sensor uh, and then sets it to fueling mode and then of course we hold on the lane change button to fuel the car and then when we're done we drive away and the car drops out of fueling mode and so that's how that works yeah, okay yeah um, so now the, the car pulls into the pit uh, and runs over the sensor then the system knows yeah it's in the pit but when it leaves uh, there's no sensor over at this end um, and so how does the uh, 
you know, how does the, 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 the track or the system know that the car left pit lane in, in order to, to drop it out of fueling mode? Uh, well, actually it doesn't. Um, it's just going on assumptions. And that assumption is based on the throttle position. So once you get to say a third or half throttle uh, roughly, then uh, the system just you know, assumes that yeah, you're racing now, you're not driving that fast in the pits and therefore it drops it out of fueling mode. Now, one thing to keep in mind, the car does not know that it's in the pits. Okay, It runs over the sensor, uh, but it doesn't know it ran over a sensor. The, the, the track or the system actually does the fuel management uh, when it's in this in this configuration here. Uh, now, with this other configuration that I mentioned where we have, we don't have this piece right here, uh, but rather this, the fueling works a little bit differently. Uh, we pull into fuel and uh, once we get past this point right here, the car fuels automatically. Uh, it doesn't really have a fueling wood, it just starts fueling. Uh, don't need to pull the lane change button down. Um, and then once the car leaves the pit here and gets past this point, it automatically stops fueling uh, if it hadn't already stopped you know, already. So how does the car know that it is in pit road? Like you can take it from anywhere on the track and put it in, it knows. You can take it out of the box and put it in pit lane and it knows. And of course it has to know uh, because the fuel management in this mode is controlled by the decoder in the car, not by the processor. Um, well, we have, I'm gonna reconfigure this a little bit. Yeah, so it's easier to see what I'm talking about. This part of the pit here, the rail, is isolated from the rest of the track. And so the power here is not the same as the power here. It's not directly connected. Now in the pit entry piece, we got this decoder. And uh, of course, that's what handles the, the lane changing, but it's also kind of acting like an encoder of sorts because that is what's powering just this part of pit lane. And so uh, the power here is being modified uh, to, to where the cars can discern it from the power in the rest of the track. Uh, now, scale electric, as far as I know, do not have any sort of a, an advanced uh, you know, pit lane adapter like Career does, and so in which case uh, their pit uh, operation probably works in a similar fashion. Exactly what alterations are made to the power at this point, I don't know. Uh, my findings are inconclusive, so I apologize. I kind of ran out of knowledge uh, at that point right there. Um, however, uh, chances are that the uh, uh, you know, decoder in here is just recoding the power. And I remember the power uh, is embedded with the, the digital code. And so in order to understand how that might work then, it would be good to know more about how that digital code is embedded in the power. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. One thing to understand is that we don't have power running through the track and then have like this secondary uh, transmission or data stream or something like running alongside of it with uh, with the digital instructions. But uh, as I said before, uh, that that logic is is embedded in the power uh, and it's doing that by manipulating uh, the power, uh, basically how it's being delivered. So how does that work? Uh, it's complicated. Uh, I don't even understand it myself, but it just trust me. Okay, it might be complicated, but I'm going to simplify it. Now, actually, this is this is my third time through this sequence, uh, and uh, the first time I did the editing and it came up way too long, and then so I tried it again to cut it down and it's still too long. Uh, I just I need to ditch more of these technical details. So third time's a charm, right? So here goes. As I was saying, the logic is imparted into the power by modifying the way that it's delivered, and depending on the brand, uh, it'll either modify the frequency or the voltage. Uh, and then those changes uh, are essentially interpreted, you know, by the car as, uh, as logic, right? One zeros uh, on off, right? There's only two states binary, right? So that probably doesn't make any sense yet until I give you some examples. So for example, uh, the power in the scale electric track is in the form of a square wave, uh, essentially a form of alternating current, you know, where the polarities will switch back and forth regularly. Now. Uh, different than the AC that you might be familiar with, like in your house, uh, where it's got a, a set frequency, uh, where the half of a wave, right, is in one polarity, is uh, a duration, duration, and the other half, the other half wave, 
you know, together makes a full wave uh, is in a certain duration. Uh, and then, uh, you know, so many of those makes up your, your frequency, right? So like in the U.S., it's 60 hertz, 60, 60 waves per second. Uh, in Europe, I think it's 50 hertz. So in scale electric, those waves are, are the durations uh, of the polarities are not fixed. So uh, you might have a uh, half wave of a duration of 56 microseconds. Uh, and then the resulting or the subsequent half wave and the reverse polarity also 56 microseconds. And that would be a logical one. And a logical zero would be twice that. So you'd have 112 microseconds and one polarity and 112 and the other polarity. And that would be a logical zero. Uh, now, you know, talking about microseconds here, uh, we were talking about uh, packet delivery times. We were talking in terms of milliseconds, thousands of a second. Uh, microseconds is millionths of a second. So uh, we have this power delivery, and so the wave might look something like this, right? We got all these varying uh, frequencies or durations on these full waves. And so the car then is receiving this, and it's using the power, it's power, so it's using that to power itself, but at the same time, it's interpreting uh, these different uh, durations of these waves or cycles. So it's like it's got this little orphan anti decoder ring over there, and uh, now it doesn't have a full alphabet on it. It's just got two two settings, two states, right? <laughs> One or zero. And so it sees, okay, 56 microseconds uh, on that uh, half and the other half. Yeah, that's a one. Okay, 112 microseconds on you know, two subsequent half waves. That's a zero. Okay, one, zero. And then you can see how it kind of like compiles, you know, or reconstructs this you know, digital sequence or sequence of binary uh, on the other end. Thus, those are the instructions. Now, Carrera uses direct current to power the track and the car, so it doesn't have this this waveform, this alternating waveform, where it can you know, modify or alter the the frequency or the wavelength essentially. Uh, so instead, it just uses periods of zero volts in order to impart the logic. So. Uh, when the power drops essentially zero, no voltage, uh, for a certain duration of time, uh, that will indicate whether it's a logical one or zero. So if you look at this graph here, uh, actually it's a, an oscilloscope capture, that thick line at the top is your, your normal voltage, and then you see you've got these little concentrations uh, underneath here, and those are bytes, uh, eight bits in a byte. Uh, now if we expand one of those you know, concentrations here, uh, you can see that it's got you know those eight bits in there of different durations, and those of a longer duration are uh, logical one, and then the ones of shorter duration are a logical zero. So you know essentially, you know, uh, Carrera we just had this again, you know, all these small short interruptions of power. So like scale electric, uh, the Carrera car is receiving the power and it's using the power to power itself, but at the same time. You know, analyzing the way that the power is delivered and looking at all these periods of zero voltage and the durations in order to you know, rebuild this you know, binary sequence. Right. So what I just described here just was just kind of detailing what you see at the end, uh, you know, the power at the track. Uh, the stuff in the middle basically is, you know, how do you take a power source and, uh, you know, imp impregnate it, I guess, with, with a signal, you know, that's the modulation part, that was the TMI that I got rid of. But uh, in case you wanted to learn more about how that works, uh, Scale Electric uh, uses a system called uh, phase shift keying modulation or PSK, uh, same thing that uh, they use for the digital trains, the DCC system. Now the system that Carrera uses, it's called Pulse Position Modulation or PPM. Uh, now, you, that might sound familiar if you're into radio control hobbies. Sometimes uh, radio manufacturers will use that as a selling point, you know. Hey, it's got PPM, you know, like anybody knows what the, what the fuck that is anyway. Uh, but hey, it sounds good, right? Okay, so anyway, hopefully this helps you better understand how a digital track can communicate with the cars. And that is how digital slot car tracks work on a semi-technical level. If you found this video interesting, please give it a thumbs up. Also, if I've answered any questions that you've always had about digital slot cars, let me know what those are in the comments. As usual, we really appreciate you watching, and we'll see you at the finish line.